Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming back. I hope you got your express shots. OK, so I stopped at this point where I said, uh, <clears throat> for the param parameter learning, we can go beyond just numeric weights. So let's try and figure out, uh, you know, um, can we also learn the structure? So, you know, so far we assume the structure is given and um, that, you know, you have to figure out the weights for these for these formulas. Can you hear, can you hear me on the back? Yes, no? Okay. Uh, so uh, the question we can figure out, uh, we're going to figure out now is, can we also learn the structure? Okay. So the idea is, of course, you want to learn representations from data. And this obviously is much more challenging than parameter learning. And essentially, if you look in the literature, there are two kind of approaches that dominate, right? Uh, the first is Bayesian structure learning. And this is typically based on log likelihood measures. And the second thing that is program induction, so essentially in, uh, in, in the sense of inductive logic programming. So thankfully, Christian mentioned both of these you know, during his presentation. But I'll try and motivate what's the unique thing when it happens in the case of the continuous distributions. So let's start with the first guy, which is uh, Bayesian structure learning with weighted model integration. So Bayesian structure learning is a very long history, right? So essentially, you're trying to figure out what are the dependencies in terms of the variables from data. And uh, what you try and do is use likelihood-based criteria to rate different representations. And you stop when you've found a representation that matches the expectations with the data. It's the same idea, right? Uh, but the key difference, however, is that you know, in, in structure learning, you use inference as a subroutine because you're trying to measure how well it's kept probabilistically capturing the data. And because I said inference was intractable, so it shot me hard, learning also becomes intractable as a result of that. So the tractable learning paradigm, which Christian mentioned as well, is asking the question, why don't we learn representations that already permit efficient inference? And this way it sidesteps the, the downsides of having intractable representation. So, um, the kind of one kind of tractable representation that's of interest here are some product networks. Um, you know, um, these, as uh, was mentioned, these are basically derived from these kinds of uh, data structures called arithmetic circuits. And the idea is fairly simple, right? At the leaf nodes, you basically have univariate distributions. And as you go up, you have, you have two choices. You have either some nodes or product nodes. And if you think back about how you define weighted model counting, right, it was a sum of models, the product of literals, you suddenly start seeing that there is actually some kind of similarity um, in terms of you know, weighted model counting and some product networks. And in fact, it turns out, uh, in, in regardless of whether you consider uh, variations of arithmetic circuits and some product networks, in the form of weighted model counting, they lead to the same kind of um, uh, same kind of representation. So essentially, both of them can model, they, they have the same kind of um, uh, computational abilities in terms of uh, computing the partition function and other kinds of condition properties when you reduce it to the weighted model counting formulation. Okay, so the advantages of some product networks is that it's A, it's a graphical model, and B, it's sort of an interpretable deep architecture, right? So essentially, you can have latent variables going all the way up. Um, so, um, you know, so it's essentially a deep network, but the whole network itself has a probabilistic semantics. And finally, the most attractive thing uh, is that probabilistic queries are actually computable in time polynomial in the circuit size. Just to give you an idea of how well, uh, you know, SPNs can sometimes represent certain distributions, if you contrast these two guys, this is capturing the mixture distribution, okay? And uh, this is it, if you, if you consider a naive representation, uh, and you're considering a fully connected network, and as you can see, it's extremely dense. But it turns out you can represent this problem using an SPN in a much more uh, low tree width model. Uh, this has a number of advantages because uh, you typically can do a single pass on this network and compute proxy queries. Okay, so there are quite interesting properties here. To give you a much more intuitive example, Imagine I'm trying to construct a some product network that defines what does it mean to be an office space, okay? An office space typically has windows, right? It, ha it might have a lamp, it might have a desk. And what the some product network essentially learns is different compositions. It learns mixtures of what it means to create a lamp, 
what, what does it mean to have a laptop? What does it mean to have a cable? What, is, what does it mean to have a laptop on a cable, so on and so forth? And, you know, you essentially, uh, in that sense, each of these triggers, right, the leaf nodes, stand for a certain feature being true or false, right? So it's learning sums and weighted sums of, uh, of features. So how would we do structure learning with weighted model integration? The key idea really is to look at the data points and sort of think about what the sums and the products mean, okay? So the idea behind SPNs is that as soon as you have um, independence, right, you can basically construct a product node. So think about all the variables you're doing and Im imagine you're able to figure out certain chunks which are independent from other chunks to unify these, right? then if you think about the partition function, it's breaking, it's breaking down into individual segments, right? So that you can combine them using the product node, but within each of those segments, right, you're essentially a sum node to put them together, okay? So what you would do is that you would look at your training data set and try to identify these independence across these variables. And if there, there is independence, then for each of those uh, each of those clusters, you do a sum sum um, construction. For each of these independent each of these clusters, you do a product construction. But the key point is that when it comes down to the to the to the um, each of the individual variables, you use weighted model integration to basically learn polynomials for that variable. So here's a pictographic representation. Okay, so essentially if you think about the leap node, right? You have intervals like this, right? You have weights on these guys, so you have polynomials on these weights. And this is done exactly as I described, you know, just before we took the break. And uh, using these polynomials and these, uh, and these intervals, you can basically compute probabilistic queries, typically in one pass. Well, often what happens is that you can get a query that uh, not only mentions one interval, but many intervals. So what you need to do is you need to recursively decompose that query, compute it for each of the individual intervals and, and percolate these answers upwards. Okay, so you might actually require multiple passes, but in any case, it will be polynomial in the network size. So here's some, uh, some, um, some, some, some fits on some representations we learned. So this is a diabetes data set. And like it, or what I mentioned in the parameter learning part, Right, so depending on how many bins you have, you can get different fits for the data. So this is a two bin model, so two intervals. And you can see the fit is not that great, but and I go to a five, uh, five bin model, so five intervals, you get a really good fit, right? What about how well does it compare? Like why do we need these polynomials? So you could essentially look at the log likelihood improvement, and what you often see is that you consider the case where you don't learn these continuous distributions, you get one of these graphs. So essentially, that's the uh, that's the uh, fit of the of the model to the data. But as soon as you learn polynomials, you get a really a really high log likelihood, which means it's a very good fit for the data. So you can ask yourself, right? Um, what kind of polynomials do we need? Remember the, when I discussed parameter learning, I said you know you have an upper bound and the number of degrees. So what's this degree? Should it be a hundred, a thousand, a million? It turns out in practice. Um, if you're looking at log likelihood scores, actually you don't need a whole lot. So this is a bunch of data sets we tried it on. And um, what you can see is essentially the percentage of the number of um, uh, variables requiring degrees of certain sorts, right? So for instance, about 17% require third degree polynomials for this data set. Um, about 16% require fourth degree. 33% require fifth degree and 33% require six degree, right? And this is one of the most extreme cases. Often you see, for instance, in this case, in the iris data set, you know, at fourth degree, you often get 50% of the points, so you're done. You don't really need to go beyond that. In fact, for most of the data sets, we haven't seen good reasons to go beyond six, right? So the upper bound is not that high. Um, and in fact, you could, if, if you wanted, you could even stick to uh, just a third degree polynomial and the small, you know, uh, small uh, loss of, uh, of uh, likelihood measure and still get very good representations. 
Okay, so um, I discussed one kind of structure learning, but there's a very different kind of structure learning, right? And I mentioned uh, that inductive logic programming is one of the paradigms for learning for learning structures. So how does inductive logic programming work? So imagine you have these data points. Um, it says, for instance, Bart is a parent of Stein, Bart is a parent of Peter, so on and so forth, okay? And then I discuss the individuals who are female, the individuals that are male. And I say, for instance, that Esther is the grandmother of Sotkin. So what I'm going to understand from, this, from these data points is what kind of rule triggers this grandmother relation. And what uh, inductive logic programming can do for you is it can basically learn a rule like this, which says that if A is not male, if A is the parent of C, C is the parent of B, then, uh, then A is the grandmother of B, right? So purely from these data points, I'm learning a fairly complex rule. You could, uh, you could go a step further, and you could say, what if my examples are noisy? So I don't have absolute truth about my points. I believe that some, some atoms are much more likely than others, and this give, gets you to probabilistic ILP. So the way it works is that you have a set of examples, okay, consisting of pairs, so X is a ground fact, and P is its probability, okay? You have some kind of background knowledge, which can be arbitrarily complex. You have a hypothesis space, which tells you the kinds of rules you want, you're allowing to learn. And what you're trying to do is find one hypothesis that minimizes the loss of, of capturing the rule for these examples, okay? So ideally, you know, you want to learn programs like this, right? You want to learn uh, the probabilities and atoms, and the probabilities of rules themselves. Okay, so that's that's the that's the holy grail to essentially induce these kinds of programs. The question is, can we try and do something regarding IRP for essentially learning these kinds of programs in the continuous space? So to do that, let us look at a case of these uh, the specific probabilistic logic programming paradigm I'm talking about is problem, and let's consider the case where you can model continuous distributions in this logic programming language. So uh, this is what is called a hybrid problem, okay? And what this program here is doing is it's capturing a mixture of the mixture. And the mixture works as follows, okay? I'm, I'm going to talk about two kinds of intelligence. Uh, a normal intelligence, which is centered around 90, a Gaussian distribution centered around 90, and what I consider a smart intelligence, which is a Gaussian distribution centered around 110. I have a random coin toss, okay, and the probability of it falling heads is 0.6. And what I'm saying is that if I see a head, then I get one kind of mixture, which is made up of intelligence students, right? And if I see uh, tails, then I get another mixture of students, which is really smart students, okay? The point is that um, semantically, when you're thinking of this, you have one set of worlds where heads is true, and another set of worlds where they are, where they're intelligent and smart. So this is hybrid problem for you. And um, what we try and do is we figure out how we can induce uh, logic programs using weighted model integration. So what's the idea? Uh, the idea is that you, you start off by learning univariate distributions like before, okay? You discretize the space, you learn the, uh, the um, polynomials for that space. The second thing you do is you send weighted atoms to the program learner. The idea is that you now have these in univariate distributions and they will compose of new atoms for a probabilistic IRLP paradigm, and the output would be, would be a problem of program. So the thing, kind of things you've learned is that uh, if um, for, you, uh, you could define two kinds of intervals, so the intelligence, intelligence range is below 17, and mid i would be the intelligence range between 17 and 19, and you would say that for this range, right, you're essentially learning a piecewise polynomial representation. For this range, you're a polynomial that looks like this. Does that make sense? Essentially, you're, you're, you are uh, expressing the decomposition of the piecewise polynomial function as a program, right? Pictographically, and I guess a little less formally, you look something like this, right? So essentially, um, you, have, you have data points and you basically learn um, predicates as well as polynomials from the data. And these would be said to a rule learner to allow you to learn a complex program. 
to give a simple example of what this program looks like, uh, this is what is called as a, a university model. It's one of the. Uh, it's an old relational graphical model, and it basically talks about you know professors and courses and students. It has uh, things like this: professor, professors have different kinds of abilities. A uh, professor teaches a course. A student takes these courses, and uh, when he takes a course, he get awarded a, a grade when he graduates, right? Um, and a course could have different kinds of features, like for instance, it could be uh, of different levels of difficulty. It could, you know, have a satisfaction, um, you know, satisfaction grade, uh, and it, 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 there are a number of hours which decides how long the course runs for. The program you would learn for this, for instance, would say, um, I have one piece where intelligence is low, another piece where intelligence is high, and um, again, these pieces individually would get a certain distribution, right? And um, and then, for instance, I would say, uh, if the course is not hard. Right, and a student of low intelligence, and the satisfaction is mid. Right, so I'm not defining any of these predicates, mind you. They're completely learned from the data. Or in this case, for instance, if, if, if an if a student is not of low intelligence and is not of mid intelligence, which would mean he's of high intelligence, right? And the course is easy, and it's not uh, the number of hours is not in the medium. The grade, the grade is very high. Right, so you're discovering patterns uh, based on this continuous data set, and in, in this sense, the program would be interpretable, right? Yeah. For the ILP part or the polynomial part? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are, um, you know, um, there are some results in, in the paper which discuss, uh, you know, how long it takes and so on. Um, I mean, you have to consider that both this version of ILP, oops, right? So if you, so this is a heuristic, right? We're basically learning over a hypothesis space and you're minimizing, and so is the polynomial learning. So it could, in essentially, it's any time, right? Because you could choose to not consider or not explore the entire hypothesis space. But if you did it, explore it completely, then it can, it very much depends on how large the space is, because it at least needs to do a linear pass across all possible hypotheses. Okay. I want to deviate from continuous just for a small while um, and consider a different kind of setting, right? Uh, it's still infinite. Uh, but it's not uncountable, it's countable. So essentially think of natural numbers as opposed to real numbers. And the command I want to make here is that humans generalize, right? We make statements about infinite sets of objects every time. For instance, we say every day the sun is going to set and the sun is going to rise, right? I mean, of course, you could contextualize that statement. You could say if the sun doesn't hit the earth and whatnot. But even then, you know, you, 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 it's, more, it's more like conditioned. You still make extremely general statements much beyond the data you have actually seen. So you have only seen a finite number of days, but you're willing to make statements about infinite things, right? And uh, often in many applications, you also encounter objects that you've never seen before. So I want to argue the case for a new kind of model, called, which I call open universe models, uh, which captures this flavor of uncertainty, okay? Let's look at an example. I'm considering a knowledge base with these following three constraints. And the key point here is that the quantifier is of an infinite set. Okay, it's, let's, let's assume it's over all natural numbers. So it says again, as before, I'm ignoring the weights for now for simplicity. Um, so it's essentially saying, if X is a smoker and X is friends with Y, and Y is a smoker, as before. And this applies to every person on the scene. Okay, uh, John is a smoker. I'm finally saying that everybody is friends with John. Okay, so all of these quantifiers are an infinite set. And my query is, is Jane a smoker? What's the answer to that? Any takers? Yeah. Yeah, she's a smoker, right? And why? Yeah. 
fair enough. And suppose I change the query to say, is Bob a smoker? Would it change? Be the same, right? And that's uh, perhaps this gives us. Uh, sorry. Assuming what? Yeah, the domain is everything. No matter what I throw at you, it's always part of the domain. So even if I give you Bob or whatever or whatever other new name I come up with, the person is going to be a smoker. And so let's try and think about what we could do with this kind of expressivity. Right, so you could talk about unknown atoms. So for instance, you could say everybody in the universe, apart from John, is a smoker. Okay, so but I'm not telling you what John's status is. He could be a smoker, he isn't a smoker. You could talk about unknown values, right? You could say all calories are anything but black, right? Uh, you could talk about varying sets of objects. So you could if you don't define what your relation things look like, you could say all things are black colored. Right? So imagine you have different databases. In one database, the thing relation has 10 objects, another it has 20, another it has a million, right? So thing is completely undefined. And I could have a problem setting where I have varying sets of objects. But I could still enforce the closed world assumption, right? So I could say John is a smoker and nobody else other than John is a smoker. But so I can still do the classic stuff. But I can also do some other more fancy stuff. So in all cases, the quantifiers ranges over an infinite set. Okay, so it's quite expressive and quite different from the way we think of uh, classical, you know, promising models. So how could we solve this? Okay, let's consider what we do classically. If you forget about the uh, computational advantages by lifting and so on, the classical thing you would do is you would ground the database, right, with respect to all the domain constants. So let's say we are considering the simple case where you have only one fact, okay, X is a smoker, and the domain is Alice and Bob, and of course it's yields two atoms, right? Now suppose the domain was natural numbers, right? You get an infinite set. So that doesn't work. So uh, let me define a new kind of grounding. I'm going to call this open universe grounding. And what it does is it grounds the thing with respect to the constants mentioned, plus the maximum rank across all the formulas. So by rank, I mean the number of variables quantified. Okay? So in this case, there's only one. This has a rank one. So essentially, because it mentions no constant, right? If D was natural numbers, it just mentions no constant. Uh, you typically just get one. You would get just one atom. Right? So this is a, a new kind of grounding scheme. The interesting thing is that for a large class of queries, right, it actually suffices to just consider this thing, just this special kind of ground. The limitation is that the knowledge base has to be universally quantified, uh, but many, many, many uh, relational graphical models are, okay? And we have to ask ourselves, why does this work? Well, if you think about what uh, Christian presented with lifted reasoning, where you exploit symmetry of known constants, what you're doing here is just exploiting symmetry of unknown constants, right? Because you really don't care. They're all the same thing as far as you're concerned. You haven't seen them. So the fact that you haven't seen Jane and the fact that you haven't seen Bob essentially means that they are somehow identical, unless you have more information about these individuals, right? So let's go back to this case, right? Um, you have the representation exactly as before. All the quantifiers are infinite, okay? You have the query that Jane is a smoker, and what you do is that you basically consider the negation of the query, right? Because if the negation of the query is satisfiable, then, uh, sorry, unsatisfiable, then the query is empty. So when you do this, what you do is you consider the rank. Now, this has, this has a rank of two, right? Because there are two variables. So what you would do is you consider the constants mentioned in these two guys, which is John and Jane, and consider two extra guys. I'm going to pick them arbitrarily. Let's say Bob and Mary. Okay. And once you ground this with respect to these four guys, it's pretty easy to see that uh, you essentially get an inconsistency. Right? You get unsat and you're done. The query follows. You know? So what's the what, what 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 would the algorithm look like? Recall what we had before, right? So when you have when you have a condition query, what you do is a weighted model count the query and the evidence with respect to the evidence alone. 
So how does it work with the new with the open universe set? So you consider two formulas, okay? The, the delta with the query and the evidence versus just the delta and the evidence. You consider the names of the big guy, right? Just to, to be safe, right? Because the query and evidence could mention more than just the evidence alone. You consider the rank of this formula, okay? You consider the set of constants, which is the guys already mentioned, plus D new guys, where D is the rank. Ground it with this new set of constants and you're done. Right? And for a large class of queries, um, this is identical to doing the infinite thing. Right? So it's, um, it's a way to actually deal with infinite sets in a finite free way. Here's a slightly more interesting example. This is um, what, uh, uh, an open universe alarm network that Stuart Russell talked about in one of his um, survey articles. And basically, it's a version of the alarm network from before, but now it has some variables, which talks about the region of, of, of the burglary and the house. So imagine you have a bunch of regions. Uh, the probability that the earthquake ha happens in a region R is given by a certain number. Uh, the probability that the house in region R is burglared is a certain probability, right? And what you could see, for instance, is that um, if the burglary happened in San Francisco, in the first house in San Francisco, and there's an earthquake that happens in San Francisco, the alarm being triggered in this house is very high, right? And all you need to do in this case is to simply look at San Francisco. You don't really need to consider New York City or any of the other cities. Similarly, if the, if the alarm triggered in San Francisco in the first house, right, the probability that the earthquake happened in San Francisco obviously has to be much higher than the earthquake happening in New York City. Right? So essentially, it's kind of localizing the Bayesian network uh, j just based on the query atoms that you see. OK, so I have functions. We could ask ourselves, can't we do the same thing like we did before? Just reduce it, right? But actually, it doesn't work. Because the thing is that with functions, you immediately get an existential quantification. OK, so, so let's look at this example. No quantifiers here, right? It's all simply um, literals. And it says this. The advisor of Mary's advisor is not John, OK? The fiance of Mary's advisor is Betty. And the advisor of Mary could be Adam or Dan. Right? The thing here is that you don't know who the advisor of Mary is, but implicitly, right, there's an existential qualification. Mary does have an advisor, you just don't know who it is. More generally, right, if you have a function like f of x is equal to y, you can write this as a relation, it's no problem. You can write this as rxy. But you have to add the constraint that exists to y such that r of x y. That's because in first order logic, every function has to get a value. There's no way around it, okay? So you have this existential here, so you can't really use the theorem from before because I explicitly said, look, guys, you have to assume that uh, this is universally quantified, okay? So you can't, you, you can't get the same thing as before. So what can you do? It turns out, actually, even in non-quantified knowledge bases, it's already hard. Let's try and see why that, whether that's the case, okay? So here's a very simple uh, knowledge base. It says that f is not 1 or g is equal to 1. And g is not equal to 1. This is a hard constraint, okay? So it's clearly satisfiable. For instance, the models, you could set g to 2. Uh, g cannot be 1, right? So set g to 2 and choose f. Uh, in fact, you could even set, all right, if you set g to 2, then this becomes false. So you could set f to 2, you could set f to 3, and g to 3. Or you could set g to 2 and f is equal to 3, right? You have, you have uncountably many possibilities that you can keep trying out. But by some bad luck, suppose you started with the case that g is equal to 1, OK? And you think the problem really is with the value that you want to assign to f. So what's going to happen? You're going to try f is equal to 1. It's going to fail. You're going to try f is equal to 2, it's going to fail. You're going to try f is equal to 3, it's going to fail. And you'll try all natural numbers, so this program will never terminate. Right? So, so again, what we will try and do is essentially 
make a case for exploiting symmetry over the unknowns. So how does that work, okay? Uh, the theorem that rests on this thing is that for a large class of queries, what I call as the one off of delta is sufficient for satisfiability, model counting, weighted model counting, and so on. Where this one off is essentially constraining the choices to all the constants mentioned in delta plus just one extra one. Okay, so let's look at this guy, right? So I have f0 equal to 1 or g is equal to 1, and g is equal to not 1, right? And the 1 of delta is basically taking the original guy and adding the following constraint, where f's choices is equal to the ones mentioned in the knowledge base. So the only one is mentioned here. And I arbitrarily pick another one, let's say 2. Similarly, g's choices are also restricted to these two. And what you'll see is that this turns out to be satisfiable, right? Because this is going to give you the model f is equal to 2 and g is equal to 2. Right? So essentially, you're exploiting uh, the symmetry about all the unknown guys. And what happens if you have quantifiers? It's very simple. You first apply the uh, open universe grounding and then apply the one off trick. Right? So. So suppose I have the case that, you know, everybody, nobody's father is Mary. Right? I mean, we know in, in English Mary would be female, uh, but, uh, I, you know, there's no semantics attached to these constants. So all it says is that a Mary is not the father of anybody, and a person can't be his own father. Right? Makes sense? So what happens? You consider open universe grounding, and because the rank of this guy is 1 and the rank of this guy is 1, you only consider one extra constant. So you get things like father of Mary is not Mary, and let's say the new constant is Gary. Father of Gary is not Mary, right? And the father of Gary is not Gary because of this constraint. Okay? The one of trick says basically that you need all the constants mentioned here, so there are two constants mentioned, Mary and Gary, and it needs one extra guy, and I'm going to choose Gary. And in fact, you can find an assignment where you said both the fathers to bury. Does that make sense? So essentially, it's uh, it's uh, you can you know you can think about dealing with infinite models in a much simpler way uh, under certain assumptions. So let's look at a case where we actually use this in practice. Yeah. So when you said that all large class, what exactly is? I'm sorry, what? What do you say? Um, yeah, I can, but it's uh, just uh, it's a mouthful. So basically, um, it's easy to describe it for SAT. For SAT, the assumption is that this is only a propositional query, so it cannot mention quantifiers. For uh, for weighted model counting, it's a bit trickier because you essentially have an infinite number of random variables. So you have to make assumptions about what the probability is on these random variables. Does it make sense? So if it's propositional, then you can do SAT, no problem. And as soon as you want to do proper sequencing, you have to make assumptions about what the probabilities of these new variables are. Oops, going the wrong direction. So let's look at what, what this looks like in practice, okay? So I'm trying to say, find the red can in this problem, but initially I only see this guy. So I don't even know where the red can is, right? But suppose I had a constraint that basically said, look, there's a non-zero probability that behind somebody there's another body, right? And that's always the case, right? So unless there's something flat, there's a way, there's a small chance there's somebody behind, there's something behind another object, it's much smaller in size. If you don't visually see it, right? So what you could do at this point is you could remove the blue box, right? And there are two cases. You have this green box, right? And maybe there's no, still no red can, or there's a green box and there's a red can, right? You don't know. So if it's this case, you continue. You remove the blue box, uh, sorry, the green box, and you see if there's a red can. Alternatively, you could remove the yellow can. And because, uh, you know, it, it could be that the yellow can is so small that there's nothing behind it, or there's a red can, right? So it's all based on observations. You don't really know. 
We're just exploring the space and trying to figure out. It's a bit like, where are my keys, right? I mean, if you know it at the location, then it's fine. Otherwise, you're trying to pick up things and try and find it. Here's another example, okay? Uh, let's assume the small box is called Waldo. And what happens is that I drop the small box into this box. And I take this box and put it in another bigger box. And at this point, I'm asking, well, where's, this, where's Waldo? And the answer to us would be obvious, right? It's inside, it's inside this box, which is inside this box. Right? But if you think about a computer vision system, it's just looking at this big brown box and it's thinking, where is that object? I, I don't remember. I, I can't see it. Right? It's occluded. Right? And it doesn't even know if it's occluded. It might be that the object simply doesn't exist because it doesn't have any way of reten uh, you know, any retention mechanism for understanding that there is an object which you place inside another object. So imagine now you have some kind of dynamics, some kind of constraints that basically describes the trajectory of particles. So what happens at this point is that Waldo is this box, right? You drop it in, and now you know you know that Waldo is inside this bigger box, even though you cannot actually see it, because you have some constraint which tells you that if there's a bigger box and a smaller box, and the bigger box is empty, it's going to fall in, right? This continues, and at this point, even though you cannot see it, you have an internal mechanism which is telling you that the, the object is in the center. So how would we do this? So essentially, we turn to privacy logic programming, okay? So uh, let's try and, uh, you know, uh, suppose we were to capture this idea that we don't know the color of an object, of wooden objects, okay? The way this rule works is that it gets triggered for wooden ob objects of, of whose material is wood, okay? And you say that the color of this object is taken from a uniform distribution of black or brown. So you don't know which one, okay? So you allow uh, the possibility that you have different wooden blocks of different colors, black or brown, right? And there's some distribution, you could say 60% of the blocks, uh, blocks are black and 40% are brown, whatever. And again, uh, think back about what we uh, considered in the previous slides, that we, you, you, know, you can learn both the parameter and the structure of these rules, given observations, right? Now, suppose I want to go one step further and say, oh, look, I don't, not only do I know the color, but I also don't know the size of these blocks. OK, how would we do that? So imagine now I have two kinds of blocks. I have wooden blocks and metallic blocks. And the size of this box, of the wooden blocks, is given by some kind of distribution, OK? And the size of the metallic of blocks is given by another kind of distribution. So how this would say is that if x is such that it's, it's a wooden block, the size of x is drawn from a beta distribution of this, this kind. And if it's a metallic block, the size of the block is drawn by another beta distribution, OK? And then you would say, for all objects that, that are in the room, let's say there are n objects, there is a distribution on it being wood, wooden or metallic, right? But suppose you went one step further. I say, I don't even know how many blocks there are in the room. But what you would then do is to say that um, the, the number itself is drawn from a Poisson, right? Given the size of the room, I have some median distribution uh, from where it's coming from. It could be six, it could be eight, it could be 100, right? And um, then, so the total number itself is drawn from a distribution. And for all of these blocks, you know, there's a distribution, and, you know, it being metallic or wooden, right? So you can capture fairly complex scenarios. Um, you know, an example is you have a robot and you bring him to a party, right? And maybe his model has an estimation of the number of people in the room, but without actually scanning the room, he can still have an internal prior on how many people he can expect given the size of the room, right? So let's go back to the Waldo example. So how would we do this? So essentially, you would say, um, suppose I um, I take an object B, okay, and it's it's a it's a, a it's of type B. So it's a it's a type box, and it happens to be smaller than the bigger block. Then there is a discrete distribution on the probability that it actually falls inside. Right? And of course, using logic, you can do transitivity. So you can say, for instance, if A is inside B, 
B is inside C, then it's A is also inside C. Right? So if you go back to what we had with the figure, right, there is a non-zero probability that it falls on this and it goes inside. In fact, there's a high probability, it's 0.8. This repeats also for this guy. You drop in, there's a probability of 0.8, it actually falls in. And because this is inside this, and because this is inside this, this must be inside this, right? So this is, I think, the, uh, the way you really see the power of having constraints to reason about um, distributions. Um, and if you wanted to do the example of the planning, what you would do is you would also have um, distributions about how things change, positions changing, or making observations across time. And you would essentially, we've shown how you can do planning uh, using what is called discounted expected reward measures. But that's, uh, you know, I won't go into that, but the point is that you can use these languages to define very complex models. All right, I'm doing good on time. So what I'm going to do now is try and go beyond applications. And um, try and motivate, you know, if you remember, I start off the slide by saying, uh, you know, the union of logic and probability has a long history and whatnot, and people have been focusing on probability relation models. Um, but there is a reason to look at the other end of the spectrum. These are very expressive models, but they do have some very nice properties. So um, I'm going to make a case for, do we need to go beyond standard probability problems? And without offending anybody, I'm going to argue that probability relation models are still standard probability models or the twist in terms of constraints, right? So the question is, do you need to go beyond all of this? And actually, uh, yeah, this is such an old criticism. In fact, John McCarthy, who's you know, uh, credited with uh, coming up with the name of artificial intelligence in, back in 1968, he argued that it's often not clear how to attach probabilities to statements containing quantifiers in a way that corresponds to the amount of conviction people have, right? So, you know, things like, um, it's going to, uh, every day the sun is going to rise and set. What's the probability of that? Uh, you know, if, if, I, if you ask me that, I have no way of giving you a number. Right? I think it's very high because, you know, we've seen this for so long. And as I said, unless, the, unless there's a case of the sun smashes into the earth, this is going to continue to happen. But I have no way of giving you a number, right? But he makes actually a bigger point. Um, and he argues that, um, you know, the information necessary to assign numerical properties is not ordinarily available. Despite contrast, you know, this might be in opposition to like what I mentioned about parameter learning, but I think the point he's trying to make here is that, uh, you know, there's a difference between properties and statistical counts, right? So we often confuse Bayesian, uh, you know, updating with simple, simple counting. And he's, I think he's trying to make a point that there's an inconsistency in the way we do things. Uh, one way or another, I think he has a point that, you know, expecting that you have numbers in every sentence is often too, you know, asking too much. And, you know, um, uh, it, there are a number, a number of examples where essentially properties itself are less obvious than they would seem. For instance, you know, uh, imagine I give you a basket, right, and it contains um, some number of bananas and oranges. Uh, you start drawing some fruits, right? Observing the type of each and you replace it. And you cannot tell fruits are the same type of part, okay? So you might be picking up the same orange. Now I'm asking you, what is the, give me a distribution for the um, oranges and bananas. And I'm not saying there are, are, aren't solutions to it in the standard probability literature. It's just that sometimes the way these numbers are, you know, inferred is, 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 um, is, is a bit problematic. We also have the case that, in, in the case, especially in the case of lifelong learners, right? Um, these systems run forever, and you might want to ask simple questions like, well, how do the beliefs now contrast with the beliefs I had yesterday? Right? The probabilities that I have now, how do they contrast with that yesterday? Do they, does the probability of an event go up? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? And you want to, you sort of, you want a language where you can express these kinds of constraints, right? You can ask questions about the past and the future of how these distributions change over time. And this brings me to, I guess, 
a broad family of logics for reasoning about properties. Okay. What what does it what does it look like? So so far I've been considering this case where I have a finite set of interpretations, right? And they're all static, right? So each of the models, the certain uh, propositions are true, certain propositions are false, and I give you numbers on them, right? But now you're in this much more complex setting where essentially each of these interpretations potentially change because you do something to them, right? So you might have a case where there was water in the bottle, and I do an action where I drink up the water and the water is no longer existing. So, uh, sorry, the water is empty, the bottle is empty. So essentially, you have propositions whose value changes as you do actions, right? And now you're thinking about putting distributions on one of these guys, right? You're thinking, uh, thinking extensionally about how distributions change. And this is fairly complex, right? This is not like what we usually do. And moreover, because you have uncertainty about the numbers, you're often dealing with sets of distributions on these structures, okay? So it's a really complicated piece. So at this point, you might be thinking, what's the point of doing all of this? Uh, this clearly looks, you know, computationally impossible. And I'll try and make a case that, in fact, you know, uh, there are things you can still do with these kinds of richer, richer structures, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about a kind of language where I can say things like the probability of, of a formula is less than or equal to or greater than a number, right? So typically you say the probability of an event is a number. Now I, I can give you inequalities for these numbers, right? So uh, one thing to note is that uh, it, 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 even in this case when you don't have a unique distribution on events, all the actions of probability immediately follow. So, for instance, um, if you say the probability of an event is n, of course it is the case that it's less than n and greater than n, right? Um, or, for instance, if, if you say that the probability of an event is either n or n prime, it must be the minimum, right? at least the minimum, right? And, of course, if you say that the probability, uh, the probability of a formula is, is essentially the sum of, of another formula being true and the other formula being false. Right, so union and disjoint certainly work. And let's look at one concrete example where you, you try and model a problem. So imagine now I have this counter. I'm trying to decrement the counter, okay? And I don't really know what the distribution is on the value of the counter. I consider one case where the value of the counter is two of them, either one or two, and it getting a value of one is point two, and it getting a value of two is point eight. But it could also be that the counter is exactly two, right? So there's no way for me to know that, okay? Um, I could have actions which decrement the value of this counter, and I could have actions that increment or decrement the value of the counter, and I can observe the value of the counter, but the observation itself is noisy, okay? So this looks very um, you know, complex, but it turns out what you can basically do is you can do backward reasoning, right? Because if I tell you what is the probability of an event after doing a sequence of actions, I can start replacing the effects of these actions, go backwards, and consider what the constraint must have been initially. Okay, so it's a very simple trick. And um, uh, the, uh, the key idea is really just to replace each of these actions. So you apply a Markovian assumption, you keep replacing these actions, and you get back what the constraint must have been initially. And of course, you have a theorem which says that the probability does not change even if you do these actions. Okay? So um, it's quite easy to show that this, in fact, subsumes you know, existing um, results like products of Gaussians and so on and so forth. And it's all a closed form solution. So here's um, you know, a simple example. I start off with some kind of distribution. And I'm asking, how does the distribution change um, when I decrement the value of the counter by 2 and I observe a value of 5? Again, both the observation and the actions are noisy, okay? So if the distribution uh, change is not monotonic, right? Um, and it turns out that you can simply do this backward chaining to get a very nice compact formula about, you know, what the distribution must have been, right? So in fact, even though you think about these words extensionally, it's not, it's not troublesome to actually reduce it to the classical case where you don't have these actions, right? The point here, I guess, is that um, you, don't, you don't really need to construct these structures, right? 
nothing changes in your computation mechanism provided you have one of these backward chain tools and you can still analyze the correctness of your systems you know there's a lot of work now on trying to understand the you know properties of machine learning systems do they satisfy this and satisfy that and using one of these backward chaining techniques you can essentially do classical machine learning you can you can do this kind of reduction to think about how these distributions change and what properties they satisfy More recently, we've been starting to think about, you know, um, what would it mean to take some of these ideas and put them in a probabilistic program, okay? Um, so what this looks like is, is a program like this. I'm not going to read it out to you, but here's what I'm trying to do, okay? I, I give you a distribution, okay? I don't tell you what the distribution is, okay? And I want you, to, what I want you to do is to get supremely confident about this distribution and then do something. Right? This, you can imagine a setting where you have a robot and you're basically saying, look, I don't know what the distribution is which you're going to face. All I want you to do is be really confident about what your distribution looks like before taking an action. Right? And imagine now I'm trying to write a program for this robot without having any knowledge about this distribution. And you can basically show that you can write a very compact program that, you know, for instance, you can, this is the initial distribution, which is this uniform distribution. And in fact, it can be any distribution, right? And this program would basically get to the point where it gets really fine before doing an action, right? You're doing, you're writing programs that are completely agnostic about the distribution. And that's quite powerful because, you know, um, you can essentially uh, apply this program in many different settings without having too many, it's, it's a kind of a partial program, right? You're not completing the program. You're writing a partial program and expecting it to work in many different situations. So actually, I went way too quickly. Um, so so uh, let me go back to what I started off with. The, the, you have this spectrum, right? And um, the argument is not whether we need logic. The argument is more that um, logic provides this kind of way to you know, treat machine learning in a declarative way, right? So it allows you to uh, provide constraints. It allows you to quantify and qualitatively state some of the constraints in your, in your domain. And as I mentioned, you know, when you think about tasks like knowledge-based completion, right, um, you know, logic provides you access to truth theoretic reasoning. It tries to understand the entailments of, of your knowledge base, okay? And I tried to motivate these two extremes. You have this, uh, this what I call as a symbolic analog of graphical models, right? These are promising relational models. Um, uh, you know, they also include lifted graphical models, probabilistic programs to some extent, but you can also have a more general framework for reasoning about properties. And um, I, I also, I guess, uh, the, the other point I want to make is that there are many different ways of tying logic and probability together with different benefits, right? Um, you could stick to the point of saying, I still want just graphical models, and uh, I want a relational language to define these graphical models in a much more extensive expressive and compact way or you could you could go for these more general logics which have their you know which which have certain advantages in terms of being very general in terms of how you specify probabilities but i guess they do add to the computational effort that you need to do inference right so one of the i mean in my view if i look at these two extremes uh, you know one of the ways we could potentially uh, get you know try to go back to the original efforts in unifying logic and properties to try to understand are there are there ways you could take the results and the techniques that we know for probability relation models and apply it to the more general logics right uh, are there ways we can easily deal with uh, sets of distributions and in fact there has been some work on creedal networks open world probability databases that, that, that does try to address ways in which you can actually deal with sets of distributions in a much more pragmatic way, right? Um, the, the kind of techniques that are typically used here is, uh, you know, uh, weighted model counting and weighted model integration. And, and as I showed, you can essentially do learning, structure learning, and as well as parameter learning for that. Um, the, the way I implemented some of these, you know, some of these uh, computation techniques was specific to one of the approaches, but, uh, you know, many people mentioned it also during the coffee break, but they had other ways of doing it, and it's, it's, you know, it's more like a schema rather than a concrete way to instantiate it. 
Um, so with that, you know, I want to open the floor for questions and thank you again for your attention.